Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember to support our channel, please subscribe. The Secret Lovers of Elizabeth I. Elizabeth I learned very on in life how dangerous love could be. While she was a princess, she had a strange number of incidents with the husband of her stepmother, Thomas Seymour, and it's been accepted that Thomas Seymour groomed Elizabeth and also had a number of inappropriate moments with the princess. Seymour would smack the princess, who was many years his junior, on the bottom and would appear in her apartments with hardly any clothes on. This attracted a significant amount of unwanted attention, but Elizabeth would be sent away as Catherine Parr, the widow of her father, Henry VIII, became very jealous and upset. But Elizabeth was then later interrogated due to the actions of Seymour, and she would later be imprisoned inside the Tower of London. But she learned the struggles that she may have with being a princess and a future queen with regards to love. She had a number of options following becoming queen, including who she should marry, such as a European prince or ruler, or whether she should marry one of her subjects, a wealthy Englishman. The question of whether the queen should marry out of pure love was one which was never really debated. And throughout the decades of her life, there were a number of men who were linked to become possible husbands of the Virgin Queen. Many men courted her, but she chose to remain unmarried and claimed that she was married to her country. But who were these men who had a chance with Elizabeth? And some are rumoured to have been very close to the Queen. Robert Dudley, the first Earl of Leicester, was referred to as the favourite of Elizabeth I from her ascension until his death. Many believed that he was the man who truly captured the heart of Elizabeth and the pair were in love. There have been even rumours regarding whether Dudley and Elizabeth slept together and that they may have even conceived a child. When Elizabeth became queen, Dudley was made the master of the horse and he rose throughout the ranks and the two had been very close friends for years, and by 1559, there were many rumours that Elizabeth was in love with Dudley. He was, at the time, already married, and the prospect of marrying one of her subjects proved difficult for Elizabeth. She would have turned down building an important European alliance for love, and would also have probably upset the different factions at court, creating even more bitter rivalries. Dudley's wife, Amy Robsart, died in a strange circumstance in 1560, following falling down the stairs, and many pointed the finger at Dudley being responsible, and this hugely damaged his chances of marrying Elizabeth. He was proven to have not been involved, but Elizabeth, because of this, could not marry him, but the pair remained very close, and he was made the Earl of Leicester. Dudley was at the centre of Elizabeth's world, and his apartments at court were next to hers. It was said that he knew the Queen and her nature best of any man, and that the pair would often long into the night talking and playing games and so on. When Elizabeth fell ill in 1562 from smallpox, she asked the Privy Council to make Robert Dudley the protector of the realm in her place, but Elizabeth continued to mention that she would have liked very much to marry him, he was seen as a serious candidate for her hand, but later Dudley formed the opinion that Elizabeth would never marry, and she said that if she changed her mind, Dudley would be her first choice. If Elizabeth had intimate relations with any man during her life, then it would have surely have been Robert Dudley. He was the greatest love of her life, and the feeling was mutual. He was at her side until death, and he was a major obstacle between Elizabeth marrying any other person. Elizabeth adored him, and the feeling was mutual, and everyone at court noticed how Dudley was beyond just a normal favourite. Whenever the court went on progress, Dudley's rooms would be next to the Queen's. Courtly love was a common thing during Tudor times, but the pair took flirting to the extreme, and they kissed on the mouth, which wasn't unusual, but Dudley did it without invitation, and the Queen often kissed him also. They met in private, and Elizabeth did enjoy watching Dudley play sports. He was her dance partner, and partners in everything, and it was believed that the pair may have even shared a bed. 
Dudley would propose marriage to Elizabeth a number of times, but the Queen deferred her decision. But Dudley's name was eventually linked to other women as he grew tired of the Queen's refusal to accept his proposal, despite the fact they were in love. He was with her in her greatest moments, including her speech at Tilbury Docks, rallying the troops against the Spanish Armada. But he wrote a final letter to Elizabeth before his death en route to Buxton, and Elizabeth regarded this as his last letter. And she kept it next to her bed for almost 15 years until she died herself. The letter read, I most humbly beseech your majesty to pardon your poor old servant, to be thus bold in sending to know how my gracious lady doth, and what ease of her late pains she finds, being the chiefest thing in this world I do pray for, for her to have good health and long life. For my own poor case I continue still your medicine, and find that amends much better than with any other thing that hath been given me, thus hoping to find perfect cure at the bath, with a continuance of my wonted prayer for your majesty's most happy preservation, I humbly kiss your foot from your old lodging at Rycott, this Thursday morning, ready to take on my journey by your majesty's most faithful and obedient servant, R. Lester, P.S., even as I hand writh this much, I received your majesty's token by young Tracy. But despite this, there have been no concrete evidence stating that the pair became lovers, but it is purely speculation. If it had have happened, then it would have occurred at night time, as Elizabeth had thousands of eyes on her throughout most of the day. But the Queen may have also not risked pregnancy, as she worried for her health if something went wrong, and she would not have been married to the father, making a possible child illegitimate. But many historians have accepted that Elizabeth I did have a physical relationship with Dudley, and it is still a source of debate almost 500 years later. Now, another man who was close to the Queen was Sir Walter Raleigh, he is considered the ultimate Tudor man who risked his life a number of times and also gave his reputation to travel and explore and conquer. He became a favourite of the Queen through the expeditions he went on and he was given huge wealth including many different manors and houses across England. Elizabeth continued to shower him in gifts and reward, and he was knighted even. He was an exotic man, and a man she regarded as a good-looking, but Raleigh's success with the Queen was linked to his expeditions and journeys. However, in 1591, he would marry one of Elizabeth's ladies-in-waiting, Bess Throckmorton, and with this, Elizabeth went mad. She was outraged. The pair had a child, despite Bess being 11 years younger, and she gave birth to a son in secret. But then, when Elizabeth discovered the unauthorised marriage, she flew into a rage, and Bess was dismissed from court, never to return, and Raleigh was sent to the Tower of London to be locked up along with criminals and those awaiting execution. She was completely furious. But was she driven by jealousy? It was known that she was close to Raleigh, and portraits of Bess are easily mistaken for Elizabeth I, showing that the explorer did have a type. He would later be released and would be restored to power, but following the death of Elizabeth I, his fortune would change, and with this James I would order his execution. Now, towards the end of her life, Elizabeth I was infatuated, it's believed, with Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex. Despite a large age gap, he became one of the Queen's favourites, and he was brought to court at a young age, and he impressed. He was a charmer and had a great mind, but he knew how to play the game of courtly love, and he was seen as a man who could step into the shoes of Robert Dudley. After Dudley's death, Devereux received the royal monopoly on sweet wines, making him very rich. He and the Queen would play cards late into the evening, leading to many gossips to talk in the court. He underestimated Elizabeth, and continued to flirt and dance with her. But it became clear early on that Devereux was motivated by one thing, and that was power. 
He was a man driven to the extremes by influence, and he would later be involved in a rebellion known as the Essex Rebellion, in which he planned to seize Elizabeth I. He was arrested, and it was said that when he was charged with treason, the indictment charged Essex with conspiring and imagining at London to dispose and slay the Queen and to subvert the government. It also stated that Essex had endeavoured to raise himself to the crown of England and usurp the royal dignity, and that in order to fulfil these intentions, he and others rose and assembled themselves in open rebellion and moved and persuaded many of the citizens of London to join them in their treason and endeavoured to get the city of London into their possession and power and wounded and killed many of the Queen's subjects and there assembled for the purpose of quelling such rebellion. Essex was charged also with holding the Lord Keeper and the other Privy Councillors in custody for four hours and more he was found guilty of rebelling and of treason, and was the last person to be beheaded inside the walls of the Tower of London. He was granted by Elizabeth a private execution, but it took three strikes of the axe to take off his head. The execution did impact Elizabeth, but ultimately she was better off, without the power-obsessed much younger Devereux. Another man to mention was Francis, the Duke of Anjou and Alleon, who was the son of the King of France and Catherine de Medici. He was considered an attractive young man, but was scarred like Elizabeth from smallpox. Despite this, Elizabeth found Francis to be attractive and dashing, and he was a rare suitor who met the Queen to come and court her. Negotiations between the pair to marry occurred, and the Royal Council were divided as to the positives of the match. They were worried that Francis was Catholic, and the Duke of Anjou courted Elizabeth between 1578 and 1581. The pair became close despite the fact there was a two decades age gap, and Elizabeth, it's believed, actually accepted the marriage proposal. But then she changed her mind and broke the news to Francis the following day, saying she could not marry him. Francis was furious and refused to leave England, but he was then bribed with a huge sum of money and three warships to leave. He wrote to Elizabeth saying, For my part, I confess that there is no prince in the world to whom I would more willingly yield to be this than to yourself or to whom I think myself more obliged, nor with whom I would pass the years of my life. But Elizabeth then wrote a poem as he left writing. I grieve and dare not show my discontent, I love and yet am forced to seem to hate, I do yet dare not say I ever meant, I seem stark mute but inwardly do prate, I am and not, I freeze and yet am burned, since from myself another self I turned, my care is like my shadow in the sun, following me flying, flies when I pursue it, stands and lies by me, doth when I have done, his too familiar care doth make me rule it. No means I find to rid him from my breast, till by the end of things it be suppressed, some gentler passion slide into my mind, for I am soft and made of melting snow, or be more cruel love, and so be kind, let me, or float, or sink, be high or low, or let me live with some more sweet content, or die and so forget what lover meant. It was clear that Elizabeth liked the man she referred to as her little frog, and he was the man who became legally the closest to marrying the Queen of England. But one man who deserved a mention when talking about the Queen's heart is Sir Christopher Hatton. He was a brilliant architect, and throughout his career he did a lot for Elizabeth I, he was considered a skilled and handsome man, and he was an elegant dancer, and Elizabeth was captivated by him. Hatton was given a number of positions, and because of this, rumours emerged around court that the two were, in fact, lovers. Elizabeth referred to him as her sheep, and she sold castles such as Corfe Castle in Dorset to Hatton, so he could fortify it and create a brilliant and beautiful home for himself. He served as the Lord Chancellor until he died, but interestingly, 
Christopher Hatton was so dedicated to Elizabeth that he remained single his whole life as he hoped greatly that one day Elizabeth would marry him. Now, whether you believe the title of Elizabeth I being referred to as the Virgin Queen is your opinion, she had many men throughout her life who wanted to marry her, either out of love, obsession, or for power, or just money and wealth, but Elizabeth would decide to stay strong and refuse the hands of marriage of even those she greatly cared about, including Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester. If she married, she could have had a number of children and heirs, and possibly the Tudor dynasty could still have been on the throne today. But because she didn't, she was the last Tudor monarch. Thank you for watching, and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.